when Carol called to tell me uh, that I had won this prize, uh, I have to admit that I was uh, completely stunned, I, as I told her at the time. Uh, you know, the prize is so new that I had never actually heard of it. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, wondered, I, I was sort of sitting there thinking as she was telling me this, of, wait a minute, Christopher Hitchens and Marty Barrett were not exactly alike. Uh, uh, and I was sort of wondering what these common themes are. You know, he had this brilliant run. Uh, and my career has been largely very different. Uh, but uh, I'm incredibly honored to, uh, to have the rise that honors Christopher's incredible, incredible legacy. And then I was, I'm blown away that I was, I've been able to follow the footsteps of Alex Gibbons, who was the first winner of the prize, an extraordinary documentarian. Uh, uh, but I actually went back and was doing some research on Christopher's life to see, okay, well, where did we exactly match up? Uh, so, because a friend of mine, you know, upon hearing this news, is an accomplished uh, journalist, he sent me this note and he said, I highly respect you, and I highly respect Hitchens. Can't say I ever thought of you as cut from the same cloth. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I wasn't really surprised that he had said that, uh, because, uh, you know, there are a lot of things you can look at. I mean, Christopher smoked incessantly. I have never smoked a cigarette. Um, uh, he drank with famous frequency, I understand. Uh, started with scotch, ending with cognac. Uh, I drink very little, but sort of any wine that I had here, and I almost never touched scotch with cognac. He was an incredibly pro prolific writer, uh, and I've been an editor, and I have been, I've been an editor since 1983. Uh, he wrote books, including uh, a best-selling memoir, and uh, I haven't written any books. And I am my least favorite subject. <laughs> <laughs> he was a regular presence on television and on debating platforms, and I preferred to stay in the background until there was this sort of movie move that idea out to smithereens. Uh, he uh, once subjected himself to waterboarding. He also got a Brazilian bikini wax. <laughs> and I wouldn't do either of those. <laughs> And as Graydon uh, wrote in his, uh, I think, very eloquent essay on the day that Christopher died, he will be remembered for the millions of words left behind. And I may be remembered for how few I spoke, if the movie spotlight is any indication. <laughs> I feel sorry for the you know, Schreiber, who unfortunately couldn't make it here today. Uh, you know, he could not have been assigned a more uh, challenging role. He, was designed to portray someone who was both stingy with words and uh, restrained in his emotions. <laughs> uh, I said at the time that he was assigned to portray someone who does not emote. Um, and when I met Leah uh, and he came to the Washington Post to interview me, I could tell that he just kept probing and probing to find something, anything, <laughs> that was, well, a little bit more dramatic. Uh, <laughs> So Christopher and I were different people, but in truth, we uh, shared a lot. Uh, I know that in Hitch 22, uh, Christopher recounts how he was called by the Washington Post on Valentine's Day, 1989, for his opinion about the fatwa that Ayatollah Khomeini had issued against the summit. Uh, there he is. Uh, and it was, he wrote, a matter of everything I hated versus everything I loved. In the hate column, uh, dictatorship, religion, stupidity, demagogy, censorship, bullying, and intimidation in the love column, literature, irony, humor, the individual, and the defense of free expression, plus, of course, friendship. And, uh, you know, when it comes to values, uh, and I have to say, with the exception of religion, which I do not hate, uh, Christopher and I uh, are marked up in the same uh, because values are what matter most. And I think this is a very good time, uh, certainly for all society and for all of our profession to be uh, talking about values and for us as journalists to re reaffirm what we believe and what we stand for. Uh, I think it's time that we're absolutely compelled to uh, fight for free expression and free press, the rights that are granted to us under the Constitution, of course, but also I think the very qualities that have long set us apart from other countries. Of course, we're going to have a new president, as we've mentioned a few times here tonight. Uh, 
And I, he was elected after waging an all-out assault on, on the press. Uh, and animosity toward the media was the centerpiece of his campaign. As you know, he described us as uh, disgusting, as scum, as low lives. He called journalists the lowest form of humanity. Uh, and uh, even he, that wasn't enough, so he had to call us the lowest form of life. Uh, <laughs> and then finally, at the end of the, the campaign, he called us enemies. Uh, and so it's no, no wonder that members of our staff, the Washington Post, and and other news organizations have received uh, violent insults uh, and threats of personal violence. Uh, it's so worrisome that we actually had to have extra security. Uh, it's no wonder that one internet venue is known for hate, misogyny, and racism, uh, and white nationalism, and posting the home addresses and, and of media executives, uh, clearly inviting vandalism and far worse. Uh, and thankfully, nothing, nothing happened that I know of. And then there was the year-long uh, anti-Semitic targeting of journalists on Twitter. Uh, so uh, Donald Trump also said he wanted to open up the uh, libel and he proposed to harass unfriendly media outlets by suing them, driving up their legal expenses with the goal of weakening them financially. And with respect to the Washington Post, uh, he ordered our press credentials to uh, revoke during the campaign. Barred us from routine press access to him his events because our coverage just did not even meet with his approval. And even before we were subjected to uh, this unswung blacklist, uh, Trump falsely alleged that Jeff uh, was orchestrating that coverage. And uh, Jeff does a lot for us at the Washington Post, but one thing he doesn't do is orchestrate our coverage. We don't even tell him what we're doing. We do want to tell him what we're doing. I don't think he wants to know what we're doing. Um, but I think Jeff, Jeff addressed that actually perfectly at, at one point, actually on several occasions. And I've been very grateful for that, and I just thought I would quote it from uh, him. Uh, he said, we want a society where any of us, any individual in this country, any institution in this country, if they choose to, can scrutinize, examine, and criticize an elected official, especially a candidate for the highest office in the most powerful country on earth. We have fundamental laws, and we have constitutional rights in this country for free speech. But that's not the reason it works here. We also have cultural norms that support that, where you don't have to be afraid of retaliation. And those cultural norms are at least as important as the Constitution. And then, you know, getting elected didn't stop anything. So um, after his election, in the midst of these early street protests uh, against him, uh, Donald Trump resorted to Twitter to accuse the media of inciting violence, when, of course, uh, no one had incited anything. Uh, the other night, uh, CNN's Christian Amin Poor emphasized the gravity of statements like that, uh, of accusations of that sort emanating Speaking, she was being honored by the committee to protect journalists last week. She said this, she said, postcards from the world, this is how it goes with authoritarians like CC, Erdogan, Putin, the Ayatollahs, Duterte, and all. First, the media is accused of inciting, then sympathizing, then associating, until they suddenly find themselves accused of being full-fledged terrorists and subversives. Then they end up in handcuffs, cages, anger reports, in prison, and when, when the press is under attack, our history sadly says that we can't always count on the institutions in this country. I wish we could. Not even, not even in courts. Uh, if you go back to the Sedition Act of 1798 under John Adams, go back to the Sedition and Espionage Acts under Woodrow Wilson during uh, World War I, uh, or the McCarthy era, which reminds us of the consequences of the reckless. Uh, uh, attacks on, on and a reckless search for enemies. Uh, so I think the ultimate defense uh, for us lies in just the work that we do every single day. Uh, I know that there are many journalists now, including in our own newsroom, who are thinking with considerable weariness uh, about what it's going to be like for us during the next four and perhaps eight years 
Uh, are we going to be constantly harassing the divide? Will the new administration seize on opportunities to try intimidating us? And will we face obstruction at every single turn? Uh, and then they wonder, well, if that's the case, what are we, what are we supposed to do about that? And I have been asked that, and I have given an answer that is pretty simple. I say, please do this works. Uh, we do it as it's supposed to be. So every day, when I walk into the first newsroom, we have the principles that were set down for the post uh, when uh, it was, they were established in 1933, a few years after Eugene Meyer uh, acquired it, and his family lived around Granite for 50 years. And the first principle says, the first mission of a newspaper is to tell the truth as nearly as the truth may be ascertained. And I think the public expects that. We fail to pursue the truth and to tell it unflinchingly because we're fearful that it will be unpopular or because powerful interests, including the White House and the Congress, will assail us or because we worry about financial repercussions, advertising, and subscriptions, the public will not forgive us. And nor do I believe they should. Uh, so, uh, I do believe that the nation's most powerful institutions and their most powerful individuals do need to be held accountable. Uh, that's why the Congress embraced the idea of a free press and free speech, and free assembly, and the right to petition government for redress of grievances, and then codified all those things into the Bill of Rights. A little bit about the movie Spotlight. Uh, after the, re the release of that movie, I was often asked how we at the Boston Globe willing to take on the most powerful institution in New England, and among the most powerful institutions in the world, the Catholic Church. And the question, I have to admit, really mystifies me, especially when it comes from journalists who, uh, journalists who are working today or those who aspire to get into the profession. Because holding the most powerful to account is what we're supposed to do. Uh, and if we don't do that, then I don't know what journalism is all about. God forbid that we take on the weaker institutions, the weaker individuals, while letting the strong ones off the hook, only because they can forcibly fight back. The day before I started work in the history of that, of that investigation, the day before I started work with Boston Globe, in the summer of 2001, I read a column in the Globe uh, by Eileen McNamara, a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, columnist. Uh, and it was calm about uh, the case of one priest uh, by the name of John Gagan. Um, he got accused of abusing as many as 80 children. And it was incredibly shocking. And so I read it thoroughly. I was wondering, why had I not heard about this? I know the news joke. I was reading the papers pretty closely. And the column detailed how the attorney for the uh, survivors, those who had been victimized by that particular priest, asserted that the cardinal himself, the cardinal law, the uh, cardinal law, knew about the priest's repeated abuse, uh, and yet continued to reassign him from parish to parish without notifying anybody, without notifying the parish priest, without notifying uh, the parishioners, without notifying anybody uh, in the community uh, that this was someone who had repeatedly committed sexual assault to them. Uh, so those were the allegations of the plaintiff's attorney, and then the church responded by saying that the allegations were entirely uh, baseless uh, and irresponsible. And then Eileen ended her column uh, by saying that the truth might never be known, because the internal church documents that might reveal that truth were under court seal. Uh, so when there are allegations of great wrongdoing, uh, I don't believe we can settle the truth not being known. We need to know. And when somebody says the truth may not be known, to me, that's like a chump for journalists. <laughs> and that's really what uh, propelled me and what propelled my colleagues at the Globe to launch that investigation with the church and file a court motion to unseal those documents uh, that might tell us what the church was so determined to keep secret. The first question that we sought to answer of course, was whether the cardinal himself knew of this increased abuse and yet people were reassigned him from parish to parish, uh, despite consistently strong evidence of serial, uh, serial abuse of children. And the answer to that question proved to be unequivocal, yes. 
And then we also wanted to know if there were other abusers like this priest. And beyond that, did the church knowingly place abusers into parishes where their history of abuse was kept secret and where they abused again? Was concealing abuse and reassigning priests the church's actual policy and practice? And the answer to those was uh, those questions was an unequivocal yes. Uh, and the result of excavating that truth, I believe, was a public good because children were made for sale. Well after our story uh, was published in, our uh, first story was published in January of 2002, we got a letter uh, from a father, Thomas P. Doyle. He's someone who had actually worked inside the church and waged a really long and very lonely battle uh, on behalf of abuse victims. Uh, and he was ignored to a court of and he wrote this in that letter. This nightmare would have gone on and on were it not for you and the globe stem. As one who has been deeply involved in fighting for justice for the victims and survivors for many years, I thank you with every part of my being. I assure you that what you and the globe have done for the victims, the church, and society cannot be adequately measured. It is momentous and its good effects will reverberate for decades. And I think this lesson that Father Joel's left, uh, the truth isn't meant to be hidden, it's not meant to be suppressed, it's not meant to be ignored, it's not meant to be disguised, it's not meant to be manipulated, it's not meant to be falsified. Otherwise, the wrongdoing is useless. And I kept that letter from Father Doyle on my desk in Boston until the day I left that office four years ago. Because for me, it was a reminder of what brought me to journalism and what kept me in. And it's a reminder of the work that we as journalists must do every single day. The work that occupied Christopher Hitchens uh, over a lifetime, and it still animates so many of the professions to which I've dedicated for years. So for all of my style differences, what we share transcends we share a common purpose. And I want to thank you all uh, for allowing me to talk about that. And thank you for listening. And thank you for all that you do to assure the Christopher's ideas. Thank you. Uh -huh.